All right, folks. So this is part three of our series, How Jiu-Jitsu Changed the World. This is part three. It's going to take us through uh, up until Mitsuya Maeda uh, and Soshiro Satake arrive in Brazil in November of 1914. Part of the reason I'm so excited to do this, and I'm so glad so many folks are joining, is that if you train, you are a part of this story. And it's a really exciting story. It's a story of a martial art that changed the world and an art that we continue to co-create and co-evolve together every time we're in the academy together, every time uh, we're talking to each other. We are continuing to advance this martial art, and we're learning more about it all the time. And I want to shout out once again sources like Jose Tufi Cairus, uh, about Roberto Pedrera, Robert Drysdale, Wendy Rouse, who I used a lot for this presentation, a guy named Tony Wolf in England. They're updating our understanding constantly about what happened and how. Be sure to check out their work. I have a list of all the sources on BellinghamBJJ.com. Buy their books. Check out Close Guard the movie when it comes out later this summer. So. At this point in the story, uh, the founder of judo, Jigoro Kano, wants to spread judo throughout the world. He believes in its educational benefits, its value to humans as a cultural export. And due to a rural economic crisis caused by the collapse of feudalism, Japan is actually encouraging emigration. So Japanese people are beginning to spread throughout the world in a diaspora. At the same time, there are certain judoka, uh, Maeda among them, who want to travel the world for their own reasons. And their reasons sometimes align with Kodokan reasons and sometimes do not. So this is the part of the story where jujitsu and judo, which are still basically being used as interchangeable terms in a lot of circles, leave Japan and land in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, and in Latin America. As I said, we'll take it up to when Maeda arrives in Brazil in 1914. This is one of my favorite parts of this story because we'll cover the suffragettes in the United Kingdom who use jujitsu to protect themselves against state violence. We'll talk about President Theodore Roosevelt, about how he learned jujitsu, and how one of the men who taught him has a local connection right here in Seattle. We're going to talk a lot about Seattle and the Pacific Northwest because a lot of people in this story actually have local connections, which is pretty exciting for me. We'll identify the first judo dojo in America. We'll identify what is probably the first jujitsu school in America. We'll talk about the first women in America who we know of training, and we'll take you right up to the end of the story. We'll pick it up next week. Some of the people that are involved you've already met, but for the first time, I'm going to introduce you to some of my favorite characters in the jujitsu story, from Edith Garrett, the four foot eleven powerhouse, to the valiant fighter Tokaguro Ito. Some of them we know a lot about. Others, like Tengen Uchimura, who's probably the first jujitsu guy in America, are enigmas. And one of them, Martha Blow Wadsworth, I bet none of y'all has ever heard of, but that's all about to change. And they're all fascinating. So let's get this party started. Here's the contents of today. We're going to start with uh, how jiu-jitsu spread to three different countries. We're going to talk about the early Westerners in Japan. We'll talk about the diaspora and how that got spread. That'll be an overview for the rest of the presentation. The first country we're going to focus on is America. We'll talk about how the cops, the presidents, and the military learned jiu-jitsu. And Maeda shows up there as well, plus a profound Seattle connection. From there, we'll go to the United Kingdom, uh, where... Um, which, where jiu-jitsu goes to Victorian high society, as well as it is used to get people the right to vote. After that, we'll learn about how the suffragettes did jiu-jitsu. From there, we'll go to Cuba. Uh, we'll talk about the four kings of Cuba, who, if you haven't heard of them, uh, we talk about them in the first presentation as well. And my, Miyako and more Brazil before Maeda. We'll take it right up until Maeda travels uh, to Porto Alegre in 1914. But first, let's get this started. And the story starts with Japanese immigration. So in 1885, because of overpopulation and weak rural economies, the Japanese government begins explicitly encouraging people to migrate. Now, especially South American countries like Brazil show up in this migration. That's why there's such a big Japanese population in a lot of these countries today. The first Japanese immigrants begin arriving in Brazil in 1908, and they're going to shape Brazilian society and the martial arts for decades to come. Uh, that stamp on the far right is an 80-year anniversary stamp of the first Japanese immigrants arriving in Brazil. Immigrants are coming to America too, but one of the main differences in these two societies, which Tufi Kairus focuses on, is that this period of immigration in Brazil is a big, powerful period of immigration that then basically stops or slows to a trickle, whereas in America, the immigrants keep coming. And so that's one dis distinction between the two societies. In Brazil, the turn of the century period is when most of their immigrants arrive. But by 1900, nearly 30,000 Japanese had immigrated to the United States. Immigration did peak between 1900 and 1908 with a an additional 127,000 Japanese entering the country at that point. At, at that point, there were so many Japanese people in America that recruiters encouraged a secondary migration of Japanese people to Hawaii from the mainland to compensate for a shortage of cheap agricultural labor in California. So just a little bit of political history for you there. 
Well, let's talk about some of the early Western. That, uh, hang on, let me find somebody and mute them. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, let's talk about some of the first Westerners to study jujitsu or judo in Japan. And a lot of things, as with a lot of things, when they get popular, you'll see a lot of folks that are super legit that can identify their credentials, who they trained with, how they, how long they trained, what they learned, how they learned it. And then you'll see some other folks that are a bit more evasive. Um, so we're going to start on the left there with Edward Barton Wright. Now, Barton Wright visits Japan in 1895, and he is a really important figure in this story, even as he is probably the, well, certainly the least legit of the three men that you'll see on the screen. So in 1895, U.S. Navy sailor John O'Brien, over there on the far right, travels to Japan for the United States, the same year that Barton Wright arrives from the U.K., both men are there two years before Mitsu Maeda starts training. Count Koma won't start training at the Kodokan until 1897. O'Brien will be there for the next four years. He's a cop in Nagasaki dealing with the foreign population there. Now, unlike a lot of those folks that claim jujitsu training at the time, uh, O'Brien can document living in Japan and training, although how much he trained is unclear, but it's clear he trained and learned a fair bit. Now, Barton Wright, for his part, claims to have studied Shinden Furoryo in Kobe, Japan and Kodokan Judo in Tokyo, but he's sort of a serial fabricator and exaggerator, so it's tough to tell how serious to take those claims. Where his significance in the story comes in is not only his cultural impact in England and abroad, but the fact that he imports some very legit instructors to the United Kingdom who start teaching and create lineages of their own in Europe. So the year after the Count starts training, uh, Count Coma in 1897, Barton Wright returns to England and he'll bring along some of those folks that we'll, get, that we'll meet later. Alan Corstorff and Smith, the guy in the middle, we're not gonna say a lot about this time. We talked about him and his significance a lot in the last, uh, the last presentation, but I feel like I have to mention him as the first Scotsman, as well as the fifth Westerner to earn a Kodakon black belt in 1916. He's also really important in American jiu-jitsu history because he starts teaching uh, jiu-jitsu to the American military. He also authors a uh, book about judo and jiu-jitsu techniques in 1920. So think of these three folks as sort of the root and then the stems sort of branch out. So let's talk about the Japanese diaspora and how that starts to spread and with it, judo and jujitsu. So Sada Miyako, who we talked about before, arrives in Brazil in 1908. He's part of that first wave of Brazilian uh, or Japanese immigration to Brazil. And he's the first qualified judo jujitsu instructor that we know of in there. He has a famous fight with a capoeira star named Siriako. Uh, we talk about that a, a little bit earlier. And jiu-jitsu really starts in Brazil with Sadamiyako. In the center is Yoshitsugu Yamashita. Now, Yamashita is one of the most important people in judo history. Um, he's a legend, and he's the first person to be awarded 10th Don from the Kodokan, so the 10th, 10th Don rank of black belt. And he also plays a critical role in bringing judo to the U.S. We'll talk about him a lot tonight. He and his wife, Fude, and his student, Saburo Kawaguchi, arrive in Seattle in 1903, and they give a judo exhibition at a theater in Seattle. Attendance for that was by invitation only. It was a really swanky affair, and we'll say a lot about it in a couple of slides, because the influence of that night is still being felt here in the Pacific Northwest as well as in the world today. Uh, after Seattle, he leaves for Washington, D.C., where, spoiler alert, he will become President Roosevelt's regular jiu-jitsu instructor. As for the guy on the right, Sadakazu, uh, so, yeah, Sadakazu Uyanishi, his fight name is Raku, and he is a very significant figure in jiu-jitsu history, not just because of this book that he writes or that little picture of him, uh, but because he is very influential um, in multiple continents. So he arrives in England at, at the turn of the century in 1900. He's just 20 years old at the time, and he's teaching. Barton Wright brings him in to teach. But after Barton Wright sort of falls out from the martial arts scene and ultimately leaves, he takes over the gym in 1904 when he's joined by Akitaro Ono, who's another super legit guy that plays a critical role in this story. Um, in 1905, Uyanishi and his students do this textbook of jujitsu. And a sort of cool thing that you all can check out on your own is they illustrate it at the time with cinema graphics or what we would call stop motion animation today. So they take a bunch of photographs and they string them together so that you can actually see them in a sort of cinematic experience. And somebody put that together and reanimated it on YouTube. So you can check that on, on YouTube. I'll put that in the show notes uh, later on. So you can find that if you're interested and you actually get to see him training in the way that he would have trained at the time. 
So jujitsu and judo, and I'm just going to say jujitsu mostly from here on out, unless I'm expressly talking about judo, comes to the U.S. and the U.K. roughly contemporaneously. It's not clear whether the first judo man landed in the U.K. or in the United States. We know that Barton Wright returns to England in 1899 and that he brings guys over in 1900 and they begin teaching Edith Garrett, among others, who we'll meet later. So we know that that happens right at the turn of the century. The first jujitsu man that we meet in America that we know of for sure is a guy named Tengen Uchimura. Now he is definitely in the United States as of 1901. We know that for sure, but he might have come as early as 1897. We just can't prove it. And so it's sort of iffy as to whether jujitsu lands in one of those two countries at the same time. We're going to start in the U.S. because that's where Maeda definitely came to first because it's my country and I know more about it than I know about the U.K. And because there are serious local ties to the particular part of the United States that we live in and where many of you that are, are watching live. So let's get to that. Here are a couple of important dates that we'll talk about before we dive a little bit deeper. And like I said, Tengen Uchimura, who we don't know a lot about, but is a fascinating and enigmatic figure, uh, arrives in America. Um, John O'Brien, who we mentioned before, he's back from Japan and starts teaching Roosevelt, President Theodore Roosevelt, his first classes. Uh, Roosevelt's uh, friend, Sturgis Bigelow, introduces him, recommends him, and he gets Roosevelt started with jiu-jitsu, although Roosevelt will ultimately end up training under Yamashita. That, in 1903, Yamashita arrives in Seattle, uh, gives that demonstration, and then heads to D.C. We'll explain how that happened later on. And Mitsuya Maeda and Sunjiro Tsumida don't arrive until right at the shoulder of 1904 and 1905 and start teaching uh, in America. And we'll have another interesting thought experiment based on that in a bit. So we'll start with the story, though. Uh, the, the, the thing about this that most people get fired up about, because it's always cool to think of one of the most famous and well-respected presidents in American history training the art that we train and speaking highly of it. So that's sort of where we're going to start, is how President Roosevelt started training jujitsu. Uh, how that happened and what came of it. So we're going to start with a quote and I'm going to read this and I'm just going to ask one thing that's rhetorical. I'm wrestling with this, this happened in, in a, he wrote this in a letter to his son Kermit in, uh, in 1904. I'm wrestling with two Japanese wrestlers three times a week. I'm not of the age of the build one would think to be whirled lightly over an opponent's head and batted down on a mattress without damage, but they are so skillful that I have not been hurt at all. My throat is a little sore because once when one of them had a stranglehold, I also got a hold of his windpipe and I thought perhaps I could choke him before he could choke me. However, he got ahead. Does this description seem familiar to anybody? Is this exactly what happened to you when you started jujitsu or what happened when you saw an aggressive, you know, physically built dude start jujitsu? Because I, this reminds me of, of things I've seen so many times over in jujitsu, and specifically the they are so skillful that I have not been hurt at all reminds me of rolling with my good friend David Porter, who a lot of y'all know, where it's like it's an effortlessly sort of executing technique. And that's one of the things that really impresses Roosevelt about judo or jujitsu. And a lot of what we know about this, about Roosevelt, or about uh, public attitudes toward judo and jujitsu at the time come from letters that Roosevelt wrote. So you can actually read these in the original version at the Roosevelt Center, which is pretty cool. So we're gonna skip ahead chronologically a few months and get back to Yamashita arriving in Seattle in just a little bit. But we wanna talk about Roosevelt here. So after he gets a recommendation from his friend William Sturgis Bigelow, John O'Brien starts teaching him jujitsu. The World Newspaper reports on that and you can see that uh, a little bit faded up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, in December of 1903, once uh, Yamashita is back east, he gives a memorable demonstration to Roosevelt and then becomes his regular teacher. Um, after he becomes a regular pupil of a Yamashita, uh, he begins training pretty regularly and for a relatively short period of time, but it makes a big impact on Roosevelt and on the popular press. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about here is that uh, Maeda, uh, so part like Maeda's story is only uh, tangentially related to Roosevelt's story, um, but why it's related is that after Roosevelt has had two jujitsu instructors and is clearly enamored with it, says a lot of glowing things about jujitsu, the Japanese embassy asks Jigoro Kano to send a suitable instructor, that's a direct quote, in light of the president's interest. And Kano wants to spread judo to the world anyway. So he sends Maeda and he sends Sunishiro Tomita, who is an older man, about 40 years old at that time, to go and spread the gospel of Kodokan judo in America. So neither Maeda nor Tomita actually end up teaching the president, but they make an impact in other ways, as you probably know. 
So we know a lot of this from Roosevelt's letters to his sons and to Bigelow. And just one example of those letters. On January 14th, 1905, he writes to Bigelow, Dear Sturgis, last year when I had Professor Yamashita teach me the judo, as they now seem to call jujitsu, this sort of shows us how terminology is starting to shift at the time. If you recall, like uh, Kodokan Judo is at first called Kano Jiu-Jitsu, named after its founder. And so a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, but we know from Roosevelt's letters that the terminology is starting to shift. Now, whether folks are doing that because of the way that Kano wanted it, like Judo was an art form that you would learn for physical education, mental benefit, or whether a jutsu art, which is a fighting art, whether that was the distinction they were intending to make, or, or whether they were making a different distinction entirely. Like a lot of people surmise that because Maeda knew that Kano didn't approve of professional fighting, that he used the term jujitsu to describe what he did so that he could sort of get off the hook there. And, uh, but we know a lot of that from uh, Roosevelt's letters. One other notable date that we'll talk about is that Yamashita leaves at the end of 1906. Uh, Roosevelt got him a contract teaching uh, to, with the U.S. military, but after they tried to cancel his contract one time and Roosevelt had to personally intervene, eventually the contract does expire and he does leave, uh, which is one of the end, it's the end of one chapter of this particular martial art in America. So to continue with Roosevelt, in, 19, or in, in 1905, um, the Joseph Grant who is at the time the national champion middleweight wrestler of the U.S., gets invited by Roosevelt for a sort of friendly sparring session with Yamashita. And this is Roosevelt's description of that sparring session. Wrestling is simply a sport with rules almost as conventional as those of tennis, while jiu-jitsu is really meant for, for practice in killing or disabling our adversary. In consequence, Grant did not know what to do except to put Yamashita on his back, and Yamashita was perfectly content to be on his back. Inside of a minute, Yamashita had choked Grant, and inside of two minutes more, he got an elbow hold on him that would have enabled him to break his arm so that there was no question that he could have put Grant out. So I asked this uh, one uh, earlier, and I'll ask again, does this description seem familiar to anybody? Has anybody seen anything like this? Because I sure have. And this tells us a couple of things. This tells us that like martial arts, although they do evolve, a lot of constants remain and that also, rule sets drive behaviors. If you're a wrestler and you're taught, well, all I need to do is take you down and put you on your back, that's what you're going to become very, very good at that. But if you're a jiu-jitsu man or a judo fighter who is used to newaza, then you're used to fighting for submission and saying, look, I don't mind being on my back as long as, as, long as I can choke you or arm lock you, whereas the other guy is not necessarily ready for that. So that's something that I take away from this. That, that particularly hasn't changed much. The other thing this tells us a lot about is that... Um, Roosevelt's attitude toward wrestling and his attitudes toward jujitsu, because this type of stuff still happens in sparring sessions with new wrestlers, right? But Roosevelt later um, says in the letter, he sort of comments on how much bigger and stronger and in great shape Grant is and says, well, after a while, he would have worn Yamashita down. So this is where Roosevelt reaches the conclusion that, hey, if we could teach the people with these physical attributes, these types of techniques, those, those people would be unstoppable. We Americans have to learn this. And that's his conclusion. So you could make the case that 115 years ago, President Roosevelt had the template for modern mixed martial arts already figured out. So let's talk about some other important dates. We're gonna rewind just a second and sort of peel the camera back from Roosevelt and talk about some other characters that I find pretty fascinating. One of the reasons that I was excited to talk about Yamashita is the profound local tie-in and the lasting impact on the Northwest after he left. Of course, his impact was felt in the other Washington, Washington, DC as well. Uh, his contract with the Naval Academy wasn't renewed for fall 1905, but Roosevelt personally inter intervened as I mentioned before. So uh, then the superintendent, who was a guy named James H. Sands, agreed to rehire him for another year. So what happens here is, and I'll, we'll talk about the Seattle Dojo on the next slide, but uh, Yamashita arrives in late 1903, uh, does this demonstration in Seattle, goes back to D.C., begins teaching, the president begins teaching at the Naval Academy. Some of the first women start training, which is something we'll do a deep dive in on a couple of, uh, a couple of slides because that's fascinating, including the president's daughter, Alice Roosevelt, including Isabella Stewart Gardner, as well as a number of other sort of uh, high society luminaries at the time. And then Uchimura probably starts America's first jujitsu school either in 1904 or in 1905. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about Maeda's ill-fated attempt to start a school in New York City right before Yamashita 
returns to Japan, where, by the way, he will continue to teach judo until his death on October 26, 1935. So y'all, the Seattle Dojo, and I know at least some of y'all on this call are in Seattle, and we in Bellingham are an hour and a half north, is the oldest judo academy in America, and it has a really rich history. I want to delve deeper into Yamashita's influence in the Northwest and in martial arts in America as a whole, which starts with the story of how he ended up here. So it, at the time in Seattle, there was a railroad executive named Samuel Hill. He was based in Seattle, and he decided that his nine-year-old son named James Nathan really needed to learn judo. And apparently he'd heard about judo while on a business trip to Japan. So he wanted to learn, and this is a direct quote uh, from Hill at the time, he wanted to learn, he wanted his son to learn the ideals of the samurai class, for that class of men is a noble, high-minded class. They look beyond the modern commercial spirit. So Hill talks to a Japanese-American business associate who passes him on to a Japanese student who knows of Yamashita. And on July 21st, 1903, Hill writes a letter to Yamashita basically saying, come teach my son judo. I will pay the freight for you and your entire entourage. And just please come and teach my son this and help my son learn to be a well-rounded martial artist. So Yamashita writes back and says, absolutely. And later that year, Yamashita, his wife, and one of his students, Saburu Kawaguchi, arrive by ship in Seattle on October 8th, 1903. Now that first trip, he's here for a very short period of time, but he makes a big impact. So a week later, a week after he arrives, Yamashita teams with his student Kawaguchi and they give a judo exhibition at a Seattle theater. Now Hill has rented that theater for the evening. It's a private party where he's, where he's invited some of the most important people in town. We're talking about railroad barons and their wives. We're talking about at least one U.S. Senator. We're talking about a ton of sports writers, which is a very sort of canny public relations move at the time. Like I said, it was invite only. Senator Russell Alger is there, if I didn't mention that already. So after this, they, they don't stay in Seattle long after this demonstration because Hill's wife and son are living in Washington, D.C. at the time. And so Hill, who's from Seattle, says, OK, we're going to give this demonstration. Then we're going to get on the train and go to D.C. So they travel there soon after the demonstration is over. But the sports writers then do their jobs, the jobs that Hill was hoping that they would do. The favorable publicity that surrounds this demonstration leads to a lot of the local Japanese Americans that are living in Seattle to start their own judo club, which is known as the Seattle Dojo. Now we know it was started sometime between 1904 and 1907, probably 1904 is some of what the best evidence indicates, definitely existed as of 1907 though. And it's still in existence and in operation today, oldest jiu-jitsu or judo gym in America, which is super exciting. I can't wait to visit and train there. I just found this out. So at this point, one of my favorite figures in this whole saga sort of enters. He's not the, the first instructor at the Seattle Dojo, but he's there as of 1907. His name's Tokuguro Ito. Now, Ito didn't arrive in Seattle until July 1907, and he arrives as a fourth Dan Kodokan black belt. But at that time, uh, the instructor is a second Dan black belt named Itaro Kano, and, or Kono. Uh, it's, it's spelled different ways in a couple different places, so we'll go with Kono. So uh, Kono arrived in Seattle on May 20th in 1903, and he was the first instructor, but Ito arrives and really sort of shapes the dojo. And I think those of you that train at Billingham BJJ will sort of identify with what I'm about to, to say, because there, there's a real contrast in personalities here. Ito is a fighter and a Kodokan-trained judoka who is all business. He's no nonsense. When you walk into the dojo, or if he walks into the dojo, everybody stops what they're doing, turns and bows to him. It's very rigid, very formal, very sort of programmatic. Whereas Kono, who's been, who's been there a little bit longer and is more of a part of the local Japanese American community, is a lot more what we would say chill. I'm going to read to you uh, the Seattle Times description of Kono from March 10th, 1907. Always with a smile, Kono takes the novices who come to him one by one and patiently teaches them the rudiments of his art, slipping and gliding with them over the mat, encouraging and instructing them in a low voice and occasionally throwing himself to show that's what the pupil should have done. If one of the more advanced members of the class succeeds in genuinely tumbling him on his back, no one is more pleased or amused than Kono. So Ido is more strict and they sort of have a good cop, bad cop thing going on. So this dojo moves a few times before it lands in its current location in the 1930s. And it has a rich history, even, even not considering Yamashita. Um, Sunajiro Tomita, who is, one of, who is the guy that travels to America with Maeda, visits the Seattle Dojo in 1910. And Jigoro Kano himself visits twice in 1932 and in 1938. So it's kind of cool to have something like that in our backyard. 
But I want to drill down into Tokuguro Ito and why, other than the local connection, I find him so fascinating. Ito is an accomplished professional wrestler and fighter who will take on basically anyone. He's also one of the most successful judoka in fighting catch wrestlers. Catch wrestlers were having some success against judoka at the time, but not really against Ito. And so he settles in Seattle. And in 1909, there's a catch wrestler named George Braun from San Francisco. And those of you who are from the Northwest, I'll catch some Northwest vibes in this too. He claimed, so Braun claimed to have beaten all the best jujitsu fighters in California. And also said Ed Hughes of the Seattle Times at the time, like a good many others who come from California, he cannot be convinced that there are any good athletes outside of that state. So Braun comes up talking a lot of smack. And he also, and this is kind of funny, they, they fight in judo kimono. But uh, Braun, regardless, heedless of the American flag code, uh, wears a custom-made judo jacket with a belt made out of twisted American flags, which, you know, not super cool, bro. Uh, this does not, you know, Odo's, or Ito's pretty straight-laced, so he doesn't like that so much. And he insists that he change out of that. So other, but other than that, other than the corny sort of flags as belts, um, the uniforms that they wear are really similar to the judo geese that you see in these historical photographs. So they fight and it takes place at the Seattle theater on November 12th, 1909. And here's the thing, Ito chokes him unconscious. And this won't be the last catch wrestler that he chokes unconscious either. We'll talk about that in a second. Let me read from the Ed Hughes from the Seattle Times is there. And I'm gonna read you his description because I think this will ring, I think this will remind you of some things too. So remember, Braun's a wrestler. Braun made a headlong dive for Ito's legs. He's trying to double leg him. He got them all right, but he also got Ito's stubby, strong fingers gripped around his throat. Ito dropped onto his back, carrying Braun with him, and again, he wrapped his legs around the white man's body, holding him as if in a vice. So, Braun shoots. Ito catches a guillotine, maybe a 10-finger guillotine, you can tell from the description, and traps him in closed guard. Uh, Again, you see this happening all the time. That cruel grip on the throat did the work. So people who had never seen anybody choked unconscious before freaked out and they thought he might be dead until Braun woke up. And this actually leads the Seattle Times to editorialize against pro jujitsu and arguing to end pro jujitsu matches. And I love this direct quote from the Times at the time. The audience was mainly composed of Japanese and they enjoyed the performance hugely. The white men were not so well pleased. And so that's one of the first pro jiu-jitsu matches that occurs in America. It's really a, a landmark match. While he's living in Seattle, Ito becomes very involved with the local Japanese American community. He's not just fighting, although he is fighting regularly, but he's organizing sumo tournaments. He's organizing judo tournaments and demonstrations. He's also taking pro fights, defeating catch wrestlers, including Farmer Watson, who he also chokes unconscious. Um, on the re and, and, you know, the records of these times are always sort of, you know, we're learning more and more about this every, every year. And so don't take this as gospel, but Ito's only recorded as losing twice. Once to the catch wrestler Odd Santel, who he, by the way, beat in their rematch. Santel uh, took Ito down. Ito was injured on the takedown and couldn't continue. And so he loses their first match in 1914, but then he submits them on the rematch in 1915. And Santel beat a lot of judo guys, so that's a really impressive win. So Ito's only two losses are to Santel and to Mitsuyo Maeda, who will fight later. So really, really powerful fighter, really, really powerful influence. Um, he stays in Seattle until he learns his father is sick in 1921, at which he returns to Japan and teaches judo at a local middle school. And that's his influence in Seattle. We're not done with Ito either. So remember that name, remember that face, because we're going to return to him right at the end of the presentation. So we know quite a bit about Ito compared to a lot of other folks at the time. And one of the guys that I'm most fascinated about this, about in this story is Tengen Ichimura. And the reason for that is we can say with some confidence that he's the first jujitsu guy in America. And like I said, he's there for sure as of 1901. He may be there as early as 1897. And although Yamashita is a legend, he isn't the first judo or jujitsu guy in America. And neither was Ito. It's, it's Uchimura. So uh, he may have also started the first school in America, which we can see from, from some of the screenshots. And I'll, I'll explain those in just a second. So one of the interesting things about him is he's not a Kodokan judoka, uh, unlike Yamashita. So you had the Kodokan folks, but then you had other folks who were more from more traditional Japanese jujitsu schools. And Uchimura is one of those. His father uh, trained in the Tenjin Shoryu style, actually owned a school, which was the same style that Kano trained before he founded Kodokan judo. 
Uh, so he's a traditional jujitsu guy who later, and, and we'll talk about the Kodokan again later on. So when he arrives, he's teaching, but he's also putting on fights and jujitsu performances. We know for sure that he's, although he's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he and a partner put on a judo demonstration or a jujitsu demonstration, excuse me, at Madison Square Garden in July, 1902. So while he's living in Cambridge, he teaches private lessons to a woman named Isabella Stewart Gardner, who herself is a really fascinating figure and is certainly one of the first women to train in America. She's a socialite who has a museum in Boston to this day. So if you're in the Boston area, you can see the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and you can see a couple of the gifts that Uchimura left her, including a Japanese flag, a cool sword with a scabbard, and, uh, and things of that nature. So I want to tell you a couple more things about Uchimura, uh, which is why we think or I think his school was the first one in America. There are a couple of other schools that will crop up in 1905 and 1906. Maeda's school will be there in 1906, and there's a school in California in 1905. But there's this book, The American Gymnasia and Athletic Record, which basically all it does is it catalogs a list of gyms in America, like all gyms, which is a weird thing. But, you know, I guess people were bored around the turn of the century. And so this volume from September 1904 to August 1905 is published and it cites Uchimura's gym right here in Cambridge as the first in the country. So we know the gym was in existence probably by September of 1904. That would put it at the earliest gym in America. We also know that he was teaching privates, uh, particularly to Isabella Stewart Gardner. We know that from her daybook, her planner. We also know that from some of the letters that she exchanges with a prominent Japanese artist at the time. And here's what's kind of tantalizing. I mentioned, you know, and so, so again, let me just, let me just put a bow on that, which is, so we can say not with certainty, but with some probability that this was the first true jujitsu school in the country because Yamashita didn't start teaching in earnest until 1904. And he was teaching at the Naval Academy. So I was teaching privates. Maeda's school didn't open until 1906. So this is the first one in America that I know of. And it was referred to as such at the time, which gives us some credibility. Now, here's the weird thing. So Isabella Stewart Gardner in 1906 pays for Uchimura to return to Japan. And the reason she, pay, she pays for him to return to Japan, and this is why I call him something of an enigma, his parents think he's dead. So he's been in America for almost a decade, and his parents think he may be deceased. And it's unclear why that is, whether they think he might have you know, died in a shipwreck, which was common at the time, or whether he just vanished, whether they were just worried. But essentially, um, she discovers that his parents think he's dead, and she ships him back to Japan. We don't have details on this, uh, and believe me, I'm going to research a lot more on that, but we know this from letters that she received from a prominent Japanese artist at the time who sort of commends her for, like, reuniting this family. Uh, Pedrera, by the way, Roberto, Roberto Pedrera, who wrote Craze, where a lot where some of the, a lot of this material comes from, uh, says in 1897, he takes part in a tournament where six traditional jiu-jitsu representatives challenge the Kodokan, and then shortly thereafter, he departs for America. The irony of this is, in 1906, after he returns to Japan, he himself joins the Kodokan, where he's never been before, and he ultimately receives his sixth degree on his black belt uh, from the Kodokan before he dies. So one of the reasons we don't know as much about him is he doesn't crave publicity in the way that other instructors at the time uh, seem to. He just likes teaching jiu-jitsu. So who does he teach? And, one, and we'll talk about both who Uchimura taught and something that I really got fascinated in researching was who the first women that we know of that trained are, because Uchimura te te teaches one of them. And we can't say with certainty who the first women to train are, but we do know some of them. And this is another notable accomplishment of Uchimura's, which is he, he teaches Isabella Stewart Gardner. By the way, when Gardner is taking those private lessons, she would be, you know, even assuming, assuming he's there in 1901 and she takes a private in 1901, the, the, the first on record that she takes is 1905, but she's at least 61 years old when she starts training jujitsu. And I think that's badass. So at 65 years old, she, you know, we know for a fact that she's still training at 65, taking private lessons from Uchimura, and who knows, maybe saving his family relationships. We also know that the president's daughter, Alice Roosevelt, who is a fascinating figure in history in her own right, that quote that I have on the screen, I can either run the country or handle Alice, I cannot do both, is something that her father said. She was something of a spitfire, as certainly of her own mind, as you would expect President Roosevelt's daughter to be. We know that she is training as of January in 1905. We don't know how much she trains, but we know she is training, which would put her among the first wave of women training jujitsu. But it's the woman on the left that I really want to talk about. Uh, because I didn't know about her before I started researching this. And a lot of this comes from Wendy Rouse's book, uh, Her Own Hero, which is a history of the self-defense movement. 
So like I said, uh, given that we, well, anyway, the, the first documented women only class in America, this is the story of that. So there are a lot of, everybody on this call trains, right? So we know that there are great, there are so many great reasons to train, to train for self-defense, to train to compete in sport, to train for fitness, to train for fun, to train for community, for friends, all that stuff. But there's also training out of spite. And that's what Martha Blow Wadsworth did. And this is incredible. Let's add spite to the list of reasons to train. So she was a wealthy Washington heiress and socialite who did not like President Roosevelt. She had a number of reasons for disliking him, some of which more legitimate than others. But basically, she herself was an accomplished athlete and equestrian who didn't like Roosevelt's tendency to call physical sports the manly arts, which he did. And so, and I say this word in the most pos positive way, and I hope that comes off. So she got petty and the best kind of petty. Whenever Roosevelt would report on a physical feat that he was performing at the time, she would do it and match it. So if he climbed a mountain, she climbed a mountain. She's an accomplished uh, equestrian. Like I say, she rides horses. And so after Roosevelt talks about riding horses, one time she rides a relay of fast horses consistently for 24 hours covering hundreds of miles just to spite him. So that's pretty baller. So when Yamashita and his wife arrive and begin teaching Roosevelt jujitsu, she organizes the first ever women only class in America in spring of 1904. She hosts it at her home. And who is the instructor? The instructor is Yamashita's wife, Fude Yamashita. This is super cool for a lot of reasons. For one thing, we still have the names of a lot of the women that took these classes because a lot of them were very prominent socialites themselves. They were the wives, sisters, and daughters of wealthy industrialists, of senators, of surgeons. And so one cool project that I really want to engage on is to find the descendants of these women and be like, hey, you know, did you know that your great grandmother was this badass and that was among the very first women to train in this martial art? By the way, before you think that I'm, this is a one-off, at these women-only classes, uh, a lot, you know, th those are just um, Yamashita and Wadsworth, like Fude Yamashita and Wadsworth. But both, uh, both Fude Yamashita and Yoshitsugu Yamashita are teaching women and girls at the time. This is a photograph from a 1904 children's class. As you can see, there's a, a ton of girls that are in the class. Uh, the two names we have from this are Margaret Perrin and a Miss A. Lee. And so both Yamashitas are teaching women at the time. The women-only classes at Wadsworth's house are going to continue until for as long as the Yamashitas are in D.C., so at least a couple of years. And so the next time anyone complains to you about a women-only jiu-jitsu class, just tell them this is an American tradition more than a century old. And yeah, just imagine how, yeah, how cool, right? How cool would it be to find out your great-grandma was one of those ladies? So let's, so now that we've talked about the president, and now that we've talked about some of the prominent Americans training at the time, let's talk about one of the central figures in jiu-jitsu history, which is Mitsuya Maeda. So Maeda and Tamita arrive in San Francisco in November 1904, and they travel to New York the following month. They start doing their demonstrations in January 1905. The first one on record is at the Plaza Music Hall in NYC, and that's generally well received. They follow it up with some demonstrations at Princeton and at Columbia. But in February 1905, they have a setback, and there's a controversial demonstration at West Point. Now, there are a lot of different um, versions of this demonstration at West Point. According to some of them, Maeda armbars a cadet, but the cadet's like, I won, your shoulders were on the mat. So there's not a ton of understanding of the rules, right? And Maeda doesn't speak English at the time, so probably might not be well explained. According to other accounts, Maeda never participates in the challenges, but Tamita does. And Tamita is only about 105 pounds and 40 years old, so he doesn't do as well against some of the young, you know, muscled up cadets. And so there's a lot of bad press that results of this. Like maybe this jujitsu isn't as badass as we see. There's also a lot of like racialized and chauvinist rhetoric about this. And the Salem, Oregon newspaper at the time writes a pretty corny editorial about, uh, about called the jujitsu fake, which one at one time I'll, I'll post to the, uh, I'll post to the blog. So if you're in Maeda's position and you're like, okay, well, these rules were sort of controversial and I don't understand. Now we're getting this bad press. What do you do? Well, you take a cue from your buddy Akitiro Ono and you start taking challenge matches against the biggest, baddest dudes you can find. And one of the first ones on record is where Ono goes to Asheville, North Carolina, North Carolina stand up, uh, head like a helicopter, all that stuff. And he challenges Big Tom Frisbee, who's a catch wrestler. Now, Big Tom comes by his name honestly. He's six foot five, he's 305 pounds, 
and he is reputed to be the strongest man in North Carolina at the time. So it's a funky match that has some complex rules, but ultimately Ono chokes him and wins. And he is at, at that same event, he offers 100 American dollars to anyone who can throw him. In a theme that will become repeated, no one collects. And so this really starts Maeda thinking about challenge matches. So in 1906, we know that this school is in existence as of October, but Maeda starts a school at 190 High Street in Brooklyn. And the top map, the little map point there shows you where that school is or would be today. So I just want to launch this thought experiment again. Now, unfortunately, although there are a lot of jujitsu people, people purporting to teach jujitsu that are not as qualified or as good as Maeda, Maeda is not famous, which is another reason he starts taking challenge matches to sort of get his name out there as a professional fighter, because he never has more than 10 students at a given time. Now, I've overlaid these two maps with Brooklyn at the time and Brooklyn today, where there's still some Brazilian jujitsu schools. And just imagine how many more little red dots would be on that map if Maeda's school had been a success, if he'd taken off. Maybe we're talking about American Jiu-Jitsu at this point. Maybe that map has like 20 points on it. So um, there are a lot of folks. So so it's kind of a bummer for those of us that love Jiu-Jitsu uh, that Maeda did not succeed. But then maybe we're not here if he had, because you never can tell with history. And so we're, we have a lot still to cover, folks. And believe me, there's so much fascinating stuff that I still want to tell you about Jiu-Jitsu in early America. We're going to switch gears and go to Europe at this point, which is actually what Maeda will do himself in 1907. It's not working out for him in America. Let's talk about how, but Jiu-Jitsu will come to the UK years before Mitsuya Maeda comes to the UK, even though those two stories sort of converge in about 1907. So as I mentioned, Jiu-Jitsu in the UK is developing contemporaneously with Jiu-Jitsu in the US. And it even involves a lot of the same figures because there are relatively few qualified instructors and those guys have to travel in order to make money. So there's plenty else going on before Maeda arrives, and some of it has some pretty amazing photography associated with it. So Barton Wright comes back to Britain in 1899. He publishes an essay on the new art of self-defense, which he names Bartitsu after himself, kind of hilariously. It sort of takes Brit uh, British society by storm at the time. And I'll just tell you this, that Barton Wright claims to have studied jujitsu in at least two styles. He claims to have studied at the Kodokan. Don't know how much stock to put into that, but he combines what he perceives as jujitsu and judo into his own method of self-defense, adding elements from British boxing, from French savat, and from stick fighting. Now, that's a lot of martial arts to try to learn in just a couple of years, let alone try to invent your own martial arts. So I'll just leave that right where it is. Nevertheless, he's tremendously influential because he starts bringing in all these other instructors that will shape jujitsu in the UK for years to come. So Sadakazu Uyanishi, whose fight name is Raku, arrives in 1900. He's just 20 years old. Yuki Otani comes next, and the duo start teaching and doing demonstrations. You might remember Yuki Otani from the last presentation. He's one of the co-authors of The Game of Jiu-Jitsu, which Drew mentioned uh, on the last call. So uh, after Bart so eventually, so Barton Wright has a lot of, of interests other than martial arts. And essentially, after 1903, he closes down his Bartitsu school and starts to invest in more quack medical remedies and try to make money doing that, at which point uh, Raku himself sort of takes over. And he starts a school uh, at, in Golden Square in London, and Akitoro Ono will join him to run that school as of 1904. And that school will have an extremely rich legacy, which we're going to talk about for most of the next five minutes. Last thing I want to mention about Barton Wright is that Barton Wright's impact more so on less so the jujitsu or judo or bartitsu technique. It's more cultural. He's just really successful at getting the name out there. So much so that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle becomes aware of him. And when Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes fans demand that he bring Holmes back, in the first Holmes collection in more than a decade, he revives Holmes by saying, yo, you know when Professor Moriarty threw Holmes off the waterfall? Actually, Holmes defeated him using Baritsu, which is a typo that ends up in the main version. That's why a lot of people still call Bartitsu Baritsu. But that sort of shows you the kind of cultural penetration that Barton Wright had. So his, his reach of the martial, as a martial artist out, uh, outstripped his grasp as a cultural figure. However, he does have a, a really tremendous legacy in the sense that Raku and uh, so he, he is the first person to introduce Edith Garrod to jujitsu. And Edith will train under Raku, under Yunishi, and under Ono later, and will eventually, with her husband, 
continue their own school. And that's a really fascinating part of British history and Jiu-Jitsu history. And that is to which we turn now. So we'll start with Sylvia Pankhurst and I'll ask with a question. And it's rhetorical, right? Everybody's muted. How many of y'all have seen Mary Poppins? If you've seen Mary Poppins, then you already know something about the suffragettes who were fighting for the right to vote in England around the turn of the century. And you even know something about Sylvia Pankhurst and her mother, Emmeline Pankhurst. There's a song, Sister Suffragette, which talks about Mrs. Pankhurst has been clapped in irons again. 70 years after all this stuff is happening, they're showing up in movies. This is how iconic and how important of cultural figures these are. And jujitsu plays a critical role in this story. You see the quote on the screen that the police know jujitsu. I advise you to learn jujitsu. Women should practice it as well as men. So Sylvia Pankhurst and her mother Emily were critical figures advancing the women's suffrage movement in making it militant and enforcing moderate attention to it. So alongside her two daughters, Emmeline Pankhurst founded and led the Women's Social and Political Union in 1903. They were called the Suffragettes. Um, and when they started training jujitsu, it was referred to as Suffragitsu. Even then, they loved a good portmanteau. So Emmeline Pankhurst's husband, Richard Pankhurst, was the author of the first bill uh, to legalize women's voting in England. But unfortunately, he passes away in 1898, and Emmeline herself decides to move to the forefront of the suffrage battle. And by the way, when I say battle, that's not a metaphor. There were battles and fights and brawls, and I'm just going to give you a content warning for the next slides because bad shit starts to happen. At first, the women's suffrage speakers are just worried about hecklers jumping on stage who would occasionally threaten and very occasionally physically assault suffrage speakers, but it got a lot worse. And here's how it got worse. Once the protests start to get big and start to achieve mainstream attention, the suffragettes start to face violence from the police who regularly beat them to dispense with the protests. On November 18th, 1910, there's an event called Black Friday when a crowd of 300 protesters are beaten severely by the cops and by male vigilantes that show up to try to fight women's right to vote. Two of the women protesters die. Dozens more are hospitalized with their injuries. At one of these protests, an American woman named Zoe Emerson gets her skull fractured in at least two places and she got beat with a billy club. So that same year, Edith Garrett, who we'll talk about on the next slide, begins regularly running suffragette only jujitsu classes. Because we're not just worried about the rando jumping on stage at speech anymore. We're worried about organized police violence against peaceful demonstrators. So she forms, in, adi the, in addition to teaching women jiu-jitsu to defend themselves, she also forms the Bodyguard, which is a collection of about 30 women whose job it is to protect the leaders of the movement from getting beaten and arrested. Because if they do get beaten and arrested, really awful stuff is happening to them at the time. As, after protest leaders get arrested, they often undertake hunger, hunger strikes to draw attention to the movement. To stop these hunger strikes, the prisoners are tortured and force-fed, like I said, in really grisly fashion. And this is an actual photograph on the right. There's an artist's depiction on the left. There are entire cells that are devoted to suffragettes. In response to, to these prisoners being tortured and force-fed, um, there's a lot of political outcry that brings moderates along to the cause. But this also happens on both sides of the Atlantic. There's one night that's called the Night of Terror, where guards beat and tortured 30, 33 suffragette prisoners in one night. So this is bad. What are you gonna do about it? Well, you're gonna to turn to a four foot 11 badass who is on the left of your screen. So Edith Garrett starts training in 1899. And just think about that for a second, being a four foot 11 lady training jujitsu in 1899. After Barton Wright leaves, she starts training with Unishi, o Ono and others after Barton Wright brings them to England. She trains the suffragettes and establishes the bodyguard to protect the Pankhursts and other movement leaders. And this sort of becomes a phenomenon. You can see from the newspaper clippings at the time that this gets a lot of attention, right? As well it should. One of the things that makes it so striking is that I already mentioned Edith was four foot 11. The Metropolitan Police of London were required to be at least five feet, 10 inches tall, or you couldn't be a cop. And so she's fighting people that are a foot taller than her. She also had training. And at first, like I said, she's just teaching self-defense to the women in the movement. But after Emmeline Pankhurst gets out of prison, the government passes a law that they call the cat and mouse law. What they want to do is they want to avoid prisoners dying because that's bad press. So they force feed them. But once they get out, the cat and mouse law says you can rearrest them as soon as they're healthy again. So the movement leaders start to realize that Emmeline Pankhurst has incredible importance as a symbol, as a speaker, as a motivator, and as a figurehead. I mean, she was in Mary Poppins 70 years after this stuff happened. So that tells you how prominent she was and how important she was at the time. 
So if you're be that, that important, we need to keep you out of prison. And so she had a, such a vital role to play as a motivator and a figurehead that Garrod forms the bodyguard to prevent her from being recaptured. And so some real James Bond stuff starts to happen. So 30 or so women start to protect Pankhurst and other movement leaders surrounding her while she's speaking. Sometimes they disguise members of the bodyguard as one of the Pankhursts in order to so that the cops will arrest the wrong person. In fact, in 1914, Emmeline Pankhurst is giving a speech from a balcony in Camden Square. And the police storm the balcony and they knock Emmeline Pankhurst unconscious and they arrest her and they drag her to prison. It's only after they wake up that they realize that's not Emmeline Pankhurst. That was a decoy that the bodyguard put into place. That same year, there's an event called the Battle of Glasgow. It takes place in Scotland, if you couldn't guess. Pankhurst is speaking. She's set to speak in St. Andrew's Hall in Glasgow. So the police don't want her to speak. So they surround the hall. Pankhurst gets in by posing as a ticket buyer buying a ticket and just sort of disguising herself and getting into the arena. So when that happens, the bodyguard gets into position, making a semicircle behind the speaker's podium. And then suddenly Pankhurst appears and starts speaking. She gets about 30 seconds into her remarks before the police try to storm the stage. But they get caught on barbed wire that the bodyguard had hidden in bouquets of flowers around the stage. They were prepared for this. So at that point, a full-fledged brawl breaks out. We don't use the word Donnybrook enough, but Donnybrook is what this is. So about 30 suffragettes get into a fight with about 50 heavily armed police officers in front of about 4,000 people in Glasgow, who I believe are called Glaswegians. Shout to Pete McGregor. Outnumbered and outsized, they knew they were going to lose. But they fight anyway, because that's what true badasses do. So the suffrage battles continue until World War I breaks out. At that point, the Pankhursts realize that the nation has to unify uh, to defend the world from fascism. So they suspend their campaign and their battle for equality until 1918 when the war ends. That year in 1918, there's some progress. The Representation of the People Act is finally passed. So more than 8 million women in the UK get the right to vote, but it's only women over 30 years old. Women won't get full political voting equality until 1928, when a subsequent law gives that right to women over 21. But they might not have ever gotten that right, or at least not gotten it for decades, if they didn't have the help of a bunch of militants who knew jujitsu. And you can see an awesome cartoon depiction of uh, Edith Garrett there, the suffragette that knew jujitsu, the was in Punch magazine at the time. So these folks are some of my favorite characters in jiu-jitsu history, but they're far from the only awesome people happen, uh, training and teaching and practicing in Europe at the time. So Maeda arrives in 1907, but before Maeda arrives, what else is going on in London? Uh, what else is going on in England? Most of the fighters are engaged in some form of professional combat, professional wrestling, for example. So Yuki Otani, uh, who has been teaching at Barton Wright School until they split in 1903, that school is at 67B Shaftesbury Avenue in London, Soho District. After Bartitsu evaporates, he splits with Barton Wright and starts doing professional fights on his own. Now, Tani is small. He's five foot six and he's about 125, 130 pounds, but he tours London music halls, challenging all comers. He offers everybody one British pound sterling for every minute they can last in a five minute match or he'll give them five pounds or up to a hundred pounds for winning against them. So I have to do more research on this because there's always these claims, but it's claimed that he only ever lost one music hall match. We'll talk about that match he lost in a second. In an average week at the Oxford Music Hall, he defeats 20 guys. In just one week, he's on record as defeating 33 total challengers. And so he's winning. He's sort of the toast of the town at the time, and he doesn't lose until 1904 where that guy, the muscular fellow in the middle of the screen, Ataro Miyake, defeats him. It's the only defeat on record for Tani at the time. After that match, they join forces. They open a school together, and they author that book, The Game of Jiu-Jitsu, together that many of you saw uh, Drew from Framework BJJ hold up in the last, uh, in the last uh, stream. So these guys, oh, by the way, a um, little note about these matches. These are submission-only matches. So the, idea, the, the only way you win is you make your buddy tap out. And so uh, Tani is saying, like, basically, I will tap you. And for every minute you last, I will give you a pound. And if you beat me, I will give you a lot of money. And he never, ever loses. The only sort of thing that he has going for him, the, 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 the people that fight him can use any technique they want. They can strike, they can grapple, whatever. The only concession he makes is they have to wear a gi top, which is sort of his advantage over all the catch wrestlers that come from at the time, because he ends up choking them with that gi jacket. So the only guy to beat Tani 
is Taro Miyake. Miyake, too, will also move to, you guessed it, Seattle. He moves in 1914, the same year that Maeda will arrive in Brazil, and he'll open a school in Seattle uh, where he'll stay for 20 years. But before he does that, uh, they open a school together, the Japanese School of Jiu-Jitsu at 305 Oxford Street West in London. I want to mention that later in 1918, uh, so neither of these guys were Kodokan guys. Neither Miyake nor Tani were Kodokan guys. And one of the interesting things you see about the dynamic at the time is that when they're traveling with Maeda, which they will on barnstorming tours later, he will refer to uh, Akitaro Ono as Ono Sandan, Ono Third Dan Black Belt. He'll refer to everybody with Kodokan rank by their name and their rank, but he only recurs, refers to Miyake and Tani as uh, Miyake-san and Tani-san because they don't have Kodokan rank. And it's sort of a little bit of shade that he's probably throwing or, or just, you know, maybe some kind of politeness and respect to the Kodokan. But one thing that I found really interesting is Jigoro Kano visits London in 2000, where Tani is teaching at the London Budokai at the time. And he evaluates Tani and awards him a Nidan or a second degree black belt in Kodokan Judo at that time. Eventually, Tani will reach the rank of fourth Don. So I want to say one more thing about Miyake, and I know we're going a little long. If you guys have to have to bounce, don't worry about it. I'm, uh, but stick around as long as you want. We got some more fascinating figures to talk about. I do want to talk about Miyake for just a little bit because it's always interesting to me to figure out how these folks trained. As I mentioned, he's not a Kodokan guy. He started his training under the Fusen Ryu master, Mata Meon Tanabe, who we talked about last time. He was the guy who footlocked a Kodokan guy in front of the crown prince of Japan in 1900. He also trained in Osaka under a master named uh, Yotaro Honda, and he was a police instructor at the time in Japan, but in 1904, he gets fired for getting into a brawl. Uh, this would become a theme for a lot of jujitsu and judo guys at the time. You get in a brawl and you get in trouble. So he doesn't have a job anymore, and he departs Japan for London and begins you know, fighting and teaching. In 1908, he starts to tour Europe along his countrymen, and I told you we would get back to Raku. He's tours Europe in 1908 alongside Sadakazu Uyinishi, Raku, and alongside Mitsuyo Maeda. And so he continues fighting and teaching until he leaves for America in 1914. So this wouldn't be a complete slide if we didn't say something about Mitsuyo Maeda. He's still primary. So he leaves for London in 1907. His school has dried up in America and he's based out of London for most of 1907 and 1908, although he's traveling to places like Belgium where he's taking catch wrestling matches at the time. He's always sort of strapped for money. And so he's trying to set up big money fights. Um, on a, he, this is also the period where he starts adopting the name Konde Koma, the Count Komaru which if you're on if you on the first call, you know this, but I'm gonna repeat it anyway. It comes from the Japanese verb to be in trouble, implying financial trouble. So basically, kondekoma means the count who is always strapped for cash. So at this time, he's fighting for money. He's challenging catch wrestlers. He actually tries to set up a match with the really famous American catch wrestler, Frank Gotch, but Gotch ignores him because there's not a lot in it for Gotch. If he loses to this guy, nobody has heard of, it's bad for him. And so um, he isn't able to continue making a living there. So in at, at that point, in 1908, he spends most of that year in England taking catch wrestling matches. But um, the territory is about to be, you know, he, he's got as much as he can out of the territory. And so in 1908, he leaves for Cuba, where he arrives in December, and promptly begins taking challenge matches there. But Cuba also plays a really key role in Maeda's life that is, I think, often... Um, sort of underrepresented. And so I want to take just a few minutes and talk about that here. So Maeda, and, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide of what, what are called the four kings of Cuba. Ultimately, one of my, you know, Maeda's most famous, right, because of his role in teaching the Gracies. And one of the things that the film Close Guard will take on is whether Maeda created the Gracies or the Gracies kind of created Maeda by building him up. But Maeda was undoubtedly important, undoubtedly a very powerful fighter at the time, and was very influential. One of his primary influences is wherever he, he could go, he could draw money. And so he is the first of these four men to travel to Cuba, but eventually they all follow him. And uh, he, he talks about at the time that Havana reminds him of some of the cities in Japan. So he feels comfortable there and it provides him a jumping off point for a lot of Latin America. So Let's talk about the four kings of Cuba. So from left to right, that's Akitaro Ono, the guy who fought the catch wrestler in Asheville, North Carolina. That's Tokuguro Ito, who uh, taught in Seattle and choked the catch wrestlers unconscious. That's Soishiro Satake, who is one of Maeda's uh, 
traveling buddies who will fight under the name Nobutaka. And he's another fascinating figure that we'll talk about next a, a lot more next time because he plays a role once Maeda gets to Brazil. And then, of course, the Count himself, Mitsuya Maeda, on the right. So Maeda is the first to arrive, but he's joined soon thereafter by some familiar faces. He arrives in 1908 and almost immediately starts doing twice a day professional wrestling demonstrations. From there, he uses Cuba as a jumping off point to Mexico and other Latin American countries, where he also becomes popular. In Mexico City, he has a standing engagement at the principal theater where he does regular challenge matches. His standing offer was, I'll give you 100 pesos, which at the time was US $50. So think about 15 bucks, like the early 20th or 50 bucks in the early 20th century. It's a lot of money. He offered 100 pesos, 50 bucks to anybody he could not throw. And he offered 500 pesos, 250 US dollars to anybody who could throw him. Uh, and Roberto Pedrera did a comprehensive survey of press reports at the time. And there is no record of anyone collecting any of that money, which isn't surprising, but is also pretty awesome. Satake arrives in 1909 to work two matches with him in Mexico using that name Nobutaka. And so, so they work together doing demonstrations and fighting each other. It's unclear whether those fights were works or shoots, uh, but we'll talk about that another time. So back in Cuba in July 1910, he tries again to arrange matches with Frank Gotch with another catch wrestler named Jack Johnson, but the Americans ignored him because there was no money really to be made wrestling him for them. But finally, their fortunes really start to turn in 1911 when Maeda and Satake are joined in Cuba by Akitaro Ono and Tokuguro Ito. So these guys start challenging everybody and doing all kinds of challenge matches, and they collectively become known as the Four Kings of Cuba. And they're a very popular traveling troupe that draw money everywhere they go. The Japanese media are so proud of their reputation that they're bringing for judo and the fighting arts to Japan that they report on the Four Kings of Cuba, which has mixed results. I'm gonna cough just for a second. <coughs> It has mixed results because this builds Maeda sort of the fame he's looking for and the drawing power that he's looking for. But there are some in Japan, notably Jigoro Kano, who do not approve of his involvement in professional fighting. And that has consequences, possibly on slowing his promotion schedule, um, which we talked about a little bit earlier. So during 1912 through 1914, the four kings travel throughout Central and South America. And this is one of the last things that I'm going to say because it says a lot about how technique evolves. We talked about how jujitsu evolves and gets spread. And I want to just say a few things about how technique evolves. In, 19, in August 1912, Maida goes to Guatemala and fights and wins a challenge match against the Guatemalan boxing champion. So during his travels, he's been fighting or working with boxers, with catch wrestlers, with sumo folks, with amateur wrestlers, with jujitsu artists who aren't Kodakon trained, with judo guys who are Kodakon trained. Once he's in Brazil, he'll start training with and fighting capoeira fighters. And so a wide array of folks that purport to represent other styles as well, including the, the, of the, the mythical street fighter, of course. So how much influence these fights and how much the techniques that he saw um, influenced Maeda is unclear. But what we can say for sure is that Maeda said he didn't train much Newaza at the Kodokan. He says that in 1912, and his biographer, who's one of his middle school friends, repeats that claim, and that he was more of a Tachiwaza-focused guy when he was at the Kodokan. So it's possible that a lot of his groundwork is evolving during this time. We can't say that for sure. But what we can say for sure is that Maeda leaves Cuba, although he will return there in 1921 to come out of retirement for one last run at professional fighting. Mitsuyo Maeda and Soishiro Satake arrive in Brazil after traveling through Latin America on November 14th, 1914, and the rest is history, and that will be history that we talk about next week, because that's when the Gracies meet Maeda, and our story of Brazilian jiu-jitsu truly starts in earnest, but I hope that you've enjoyed meeting some of these folks uh, along the way, because they are no less important and certainly no less fascinating than a lot of the folks we hear a ton about. So thank you all so much for listening. Again, I want to shout out that this presentation wouldn't be possible without Jose Tufi Kairos, whose dissertation is amazing, Robert Drysdale, Go See Closed Guard, Roberto Pedrera, Craze, and um, is, and Shoke are really great series, particularly if you like academic writing. Uh, Wendy Rouse, whose amazing book uh, and whose podcast interview with me on Dirty White Belt Radio informed a lot of this, as well as Tony Wolf, who wrote a badass graphic novel about the suffragettes that you should go out and buy. So support these folks, support their work. And I thank you as always for your kind attention. I would love to take your questions if there are any. Before that, I will mention we've had three of these classes so far. The first, the overview class. The second one, Jiu-Jitsu in Japan, 1600 to 1904. The third, 
Well, that's the one we just did. The first two are already up on YouTube. This will be up on YouTube tomorrow. Next week, we will talk about entering, Enter the Gracies, 1914 to 1902, where Carlos Nelio raised an army, and that army brings jiu-jitsu back to America because jiu-jitsu was there, but it's not in the form that we'll see it when the Gracies start coming. And then finally, we'll close it out on June 30th with Modern Sport Fighting 1993 to now, which is the rise of MMA and submission grappling as a sport and an art. Last thing, y'all, really appreciate you. This is so much fun for me. I couldn't do it without you. So thank you all. And remember, this is an art that we are co-creating, which is a really exciting thing for me. So be proud of where, wherever you train, be proud of where you train, be proud of what you're a part of because it's something that's awesome. And if there are any questions, let's rock with it. Feel free to unmute yourselves and shout at me because I don't think I can see the chat. And by I don't think I can't see the chat. Thanks, Jeff. Uh -huh. Good job, Jeff. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. That was a great class tonight. Y'all are awesome. Y'all are great. As cool. always, I'll, I'll chime in with the first question. Um, hey, everybody. <laughs> um, where did Kozen Judo kind of come in instead of Kodokan Judo? Great question. So Kosen Judo is developing concurrently with Kodokan Judo. And essentially what Kosen Judo is, is a rule set that is adopted by a lot of the schools in Japan at the time, schools by like educational schools, not jujitsu schools, and it privileges Nawaza. I said before that rule sets drive behaviors, right? If your rule set as a wrestler is, hey, if I put Jeff on his back, I win. That's what you're gonna develop, right? And so if Nawaza, if you get 30 seconds for Nawaza, probably not gonna pay too much attention to it, particularly if you're a dude who enjoys throws. But Kosen Judo allowed, that rule set allowed a lot more ex exploration for groundwork. And so one of the cool things is you'll see, if you look at some of the extant Kosen Judo photos, or even some of the film that's available, you will see a lot of groundwork that we would classify even today, or even when I started training in 2010 as modern jujitsu. You see guys doing things that we would call X guard or single leg X guard, which is A, very, very cool. And B, gets at something that I know Drysdale thinks and talks about a lot, which is it's not that art advances linearly. Art evolves in a cycle. And so your art is going to, what I love about jujitsu is that it's real time problem solving under pressure. And you could say the same thing about judo. When I say jujitsu here, judo as well, please. Because like, if you have a dude coming at you trying to throw you, you're gonna get real good at defending throws and countering throws. If you have somebody that can grapple you very well on the ground, you're gonna be like, man, if I can get underneath you and get my leg, my instep of my foot on your hip and push you with my other leg, which we call X guard, man, I'm gonna get good at that. And so a lot of these techniques were evolving at the time based on that rule set and based on people's aptitudes. And so it's not that these techniques, you know, it, it's pretty rare that you'll hear me say not ironically that somebody invented something. And, and so that, that was, that's how I see Kosen Judo and, what, and, uh, and it's sort of concurrent development to Kodokan Judo. Thank you, I'd heard of it, but I didn't know anything about it, so. No worries. We're learning a lot about that too at the time. And I love questions, guys. So I appreciate the compliments too. That's always absolutely sweet. But um, if anybody has any questions, please hit me up. There were significant Japanese emigrations all over South America, primarily, I think, because it was a way where you could get land, I think, not to mention other things. But um, mm -hmm. why was Brazil more significant than, than Peru or Chile or Argentina? Great question. I wouldn't even say that it was more significant. I would, I would say that it was more significant, like in terms of the development of the art, because that's where a lot of, where it just caught fire. And I think that because jujitsu went to the Amazon, where there was an existing fight culture and traveling circuses where you had fighting and people were sort of used to watching that, it was presupposed, you know, it was really predisposed to be receptive to, oh, you know, me and Chuck are going to go watch the fights tonight. Oh, they got this guy from Japan. Wow, he just threw the shit out of that guy. That's awesome. And and, and so there are definitely a ton of, of Japanese and I would say Okinawan immigrants all throughout South America. One of the reasons that that part of South America is also significant is sugar prices collapsed at the time. And so Okinawans, particularly, and other people who lived in southern Japan would harvest sugarcane as their primary means of support. And so if there were if you couldn't make a living doing that, you had to go a place where there were jobs and you might as well go a place that had a climate that was similar so you could do similar work to what you were doing. So that's why Alberto Fujimori, who used to be the president of Peru, was an Okinawan. A lot of Okinawans did end up in South America or also in Hawaii where there's sugar cane. And so 
Uh, the Okinawan word for Okinawan is Ushinanchu, and the World Ushinanchu Festival occurs every year in Hawaii. It's a lot of Okinawans immigrated there because they could do the same work that they were doing in Japan. Very cool. Thank you. Sure, man. Love the questions. Anything else, y'all? I know I went long tonight, and so I appreciate your kind attention. But like it, every, and here's the thing, like when, when I, when I prepare these, there's always more that I leave out. There's always incredible, like, and let me just tell you an incredible story that is from Pedrera's book, uh, Craze volume two, that I had to leave out. Um, and so I'm not going to leave it out. I'm just going to drop it in right here. So during his travels, so Maeda is traveling through England, right? He's barnstorming. He'll show up at the local music hall and be like, all right, anybody who can throw me gets a pound or, or whatever he's doing. So at one point, he um he happens by a dojo that purports to have a judo dojo and the sign says what's the effect of strongest judo in london here and he's like and it's like h matsuda matsuda is the guy's name is the proprietor and maya is like all right well let's see what this guy he walks in and it's a redheaded white guy whose real name is not matsuda but he's calling himself matsuda and so Maeda sort of starts to like talk shadily to him like, oh, you must be really good. Do you want to spar? And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, and and and, the, and they spar. Predictably, it doesn't go well for Matsuda, who is probably pretty delusional for reasons that I'll get into in a second. And so Maeda just basically starts just throwing him over and over and like and Maeda is not really a, a smack talker, but he starts being, oh, you know, yeah, it's not technique. It's just that I'm big, right? Wham! And the last throw he hits him with, it, and this is what, like, everything about this tickles me. And you can read the whole story in, um, in, uh, in Craze Volume 2. But what I love is the last throw he hits him with is called Uranage. And if you look at Uranage, if we have fans of professional wrestling in here, Uranage is rock bottom, Right. It is the, the rocks finish or the what Booker T calls the bookend. Like, boom! And so it's a super satisfying throw. Makes a big sound. And I just imagine uh, Mitsuya Maeda throwing this white dude calling himself a Japanese name and just Jim Ross shouting, rock bottom, rock bottom! And so it tickles me maybe more than it should. I should mention that Matsuda later will take a fight against a professional boxer which isn't the best idea and goes exactly how you would think it was. And so he probably is just this dude that really, really wanted to like will himself to learn judo without actually, you know, training judo. And maybe that amuses only me, but uh, my pro Pedreras probably tells the story better. So thanks for letting me shoehorn in that footnote. It was one that I had to leave out. There's always really fun stuff that I leave out. So definitely do check out the original works if you, if you have the time and the means. But I love distilling this stuff for y'all too. With that said, do we have one final question?